Hello, my name is Joe, and in this course, I'm going to take you through how to create photogrammetry models for films, TV, and games. If you find this helpful, please like and subscribe and hit that bell for more videos. And don't forget to check out my website, 3dassetlibrary.com, for Unreal and Unity Engine assets. Also, if you find this helpful, please check out my Patreon below for exclusive content relating to photogrammetry, games. So the first part of this is to set up our turntable. So I've got my turntable that I've got from Amazon. You have a cake, turntable, whatever. You don't have to use a turntable, but trust me, it'll save you a lot of aggro. And for the price of them, you know, it's, it's just worth it. And what I've done here is I've put over the top of some white paper, stuck it down, and um, just literally randomly got a squiggly paddle over the top of it. There's no right or wrong way to do this. You could get your kids to draw on it with different colors, you know, whatever, as long as it's not all shaded in. But, you know, you can have a red line here and a green line over there. It's just so that when the 3D software is looking at it, it can sync up these correct shapes with the correct pictures, thus creating a better um, 3D image. And the next uh, important part that's very useful for me is I marked out about an inch gap between each of these all the way around on the top and then uh, one on the bottom you'll see here that i've got two this two means that i've done a full 360 degree um turn when i've done it all um this just it just makes life so much easier because you know every time that no matter what you put on that turntable it's going to have exactly the same amount of uh, photos you know you know that that's if there's an issue with it that's what the issue will be you know you could even make these even smaller gaps if you want to you can buy pre um etched um turntables that have all of these put in for you so you don't have to worry about this for me i just use this because um it's cheap it does the job and i'm happy with it and if i break it it's not the end of the world it's not like i spent a lot of money and the next important part is the light box you'll see here that or the lighting of the image itself i'm using a light box and it's all even light across the image and uh that's what you need on your photos you need all even light and to try and avoid as much shadow as possible um, otherwise that will get picked up when we're scanning um, so yeah we'll move on to the next part so in this part I'm going to show you how to set up your camera and the settings uh, that you need to know in it obviously you're going to have to look into your camera or your camera phone to find out what where the settings are kept because there's no possible way obviously I can know where every single camera settings are kept but generally if you type in like um, ISO Sony HX60 camera or something like that you'll you'll get the exactly where the, the uh, tutorial and exactly where the ISO is and how to get to it um, but predominantly I'm using a phone on this well no the entire course I am using a phone on this so obviously this is I'm going off of a phone here um, but the same principles apply to a camera um, except you have more control over things like aperture and things like that so but I will mention that um, where applicable like um, the aperture setting in here what, what that should be etc so first of all on your phone or your camera you want to be in the pro mode or manual modes you don't want to be using any automatic modes because it can it messes with your lighting etc when it's trying to take a photo um for the white balance you want to set it um for the best way to i, I look at it is that is you look at what you're photographing and try and match it on the camera um, if you're obviously under incandescent lighting generally like on my mobile phone you have a setting for incandescent lighting so that it'll automatically adjust that so that you can look at it and go yeah right that's spot on so the white should look like whites on the camera it shouldn't look cream it shouldn't look dark it shouldn't look anything like that um the focus i on mine i put it onto automatic and then what i do is i lock the focus i'll get the area that i want in focus on the uh screen and then i'll lock the focus manually now on my phone I hold down to lock the focus manually. I believe on Samsung it's the same principle. Um, cameras I know on my Sony that you can lock the focus to just a section. Um, so, yep, that's that. Um, the ISO, I, from what I understand, you best have the ISO as low as possible. Um, I have mine set to 50. That works absolutely spot on for me. Um, and then on a camera, you want um, your uh, aperture. On a, on a proper DSLR camera, you want your aperture at about eight, eight-ish, maybe eight to 10. Um, so this gets a lot more of your image in focus. Obviously the photos take a lot more time to pro process when clicking, so bear that in mind. Um, right, so that's that. Um, one important thing is, and this is very important, is to avoid zooming. Um, you don't want to be zooming in on your object. You want to keep your lens always um, as fully zoomed, 
in or out, is that right? Fully zoomed in as possible. And um, uh, you don't want to be zooming in and out because this can cause all sorts of problems for the depth uh, perception and the depth maps inside of uh, 3D scanning. Um, so if your object is too far away, move your object closer. It's as simple as that. Um, uh, camera tripod, we will be using uh, sort of, generally I use three different heights. Um, one that's looking down on the object, one that's, I would say, about a third of the way down the object, and then one that's about two thirds of the way down the object. Um, obviously, this can vary depending on the object you're scanning. Um, sometimes I'll just get away with two, sometimes even one um, position on the tripod. There isn't really any fixed way of doing this. You know, you'll see from my photos how I've done it. Um, if you look here at the flower, it's um, uh, got a top down there and then gradually as we scroll down um, you can see it's dropped down to the side here and um, we've gone underneath here um, so there's there's no fixed way but they, for say for scanning shoes that might be slightly different layout so it's best f you'll learn very quickly what works what doesn't work how much detail do you want to get on the object things like that so the tripods really down to you there's no fixed way of doing things although I'm just gonna I would follow where you can what I've done because it works spot on for me so let's move on to the next bit so what we're going to talk about here is the camera tripod positions um, that I've done here for this object I've done four positions you'll see when I skip through here when they change and um, taking a photo for every nodule on the turntable and also you'll see that the object is fully in display um, for our camera there's none of this hanging off the edge or anything like that and um, you'll notice as well that although the camera gets closer in some places or appears to get closer um, I'm never zooming in or anything like that so what we'll do is we skip through if I can see here that it's doing our rotations to each line on the turntable and then there's our first change there's our next change there's our next last change so you can see here that it's got all angles that I feel I need for the object so it's got the top of the hammer you see the bit there fully there and we're getting all the way down to the bottom here and the reason I've chosen this object a flat bottom object like this hammer um, is because what we want to do is cut off the bottom of this and um, obviously be able to use it as an asset. When we get into full 360 degree scanning, um, we will have the bottom of the hammer included, but what we'll do is we just want to do a normal scan that um, uh, without that doesn't require loads of work to do and um, will get us the result that generally everybody sees. And this is the kind of thing that you can go out, you know, if you wanted to take, you saw a nice uh, pile of rocks, for instance. Obviously, you, if you're out, um, out on a walk you can't turn the rocks you know over and properly scan them and that so what you want to just grab those pile of rocks this is the the method that's commonly used is what you do is you get your you, you know your pile of rocks scan them in and then you'd cut the bottom off and then place them in a scene so this is the your sort of general 3d scanning here so let's move on to the next part right the next step is we want to import our photos onto our computer and that can vary depending on your, whether you're using a phone or a camera um, if you're stuck on what to do either message me and I'll try my best to help or um, look online at the model of your camera slash phone and how do you import in generally it's you know nine times out of ten it's just plug it in and off you go and drag you know you drag them onto your, into your folder and um, give your folder a good name so in this case we would name our folder hammer and um, it just keeps everything organized then there's two things we want to look for the first thing is we want to look for um, if any of our images are blurry, if you've got the odd image that's blurry, delete them. But if you've got a lot of images that are blurry, you want to look at the settings on your camera to make sure you don't have autofocus on or make sure that you're correctly um, focused on the, you know, the correct object in your scene. Um, because in an ideal world, you want to get it right the first time with the source footage, the source photos. You don't want to be trying to fix it in a software. You know, it's one of those things. Get it right first if you can. You know, it's one of those things. So um, we also want to check the difference between backgrounds. You know, we don't want to go from something like a really light background like this to, you know, our next picture's really dark and then our next picture's in between. Um, we want everything to be, if you look at here, the lighting is consistent all the time. No matter what we click on, it never changes. Um, so we want to make sure, again, our lighting is spot on. And if, if you've got the odd photo that's dark, delete. Um, again, if you've got the option to retake the photos, if you've got loads of photos that are dark, because it means that the settings on your camera, like the ISO, isn't probably right. 
uh, or your white balance, things like that. Um, and if you don't have that option, you can bring them into programs like Lightroom or Photoshop and adjust the brightness on your photos as a last resort. But my, my thing is get the photos right the first time rather than going in and then editing and all of that, you know, just, just why you save yourself a lot of time. So once we've done that, we'll move on to importing them. So the next step, which is a very simple step, and I'll show you what to do, is importing your images into Metashape. So what we've got here is you've got my um, all of my images here, and we've got Metashape here. So you'll have something called Chunk. If not, I'll show you quickly how to do that. I'll just remove this, and um, you can right-click, Add Chunk. There we go. So what we'll do is you'll grab all our images, and so just press Control A to select all, and then drag them onto Chunk. Then what that'll do is that'll load them all into here and you can see that we've got all our images loading in. Let's check everything's there, yep. Yeah. And um, we're ready to go uh, into aligning our photos next. So let's move on to the next section.